I want to introduce you to a living legend of the Napa Valley and of American wine, Warren Winyarski. A native of Chicago, Warren turned first to an academic career. Um, he was drawn to the humanities and took his undergraduate degree from St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. He then turned to uh, graduate studies in political theory at the University of Chicago and also studied in Italy, all part of an academic career path. Um, until he found a newfound passion in wine, which veered him off course uh, of an academic career, and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, Warren uh, founded, after two, two years apprenticeships at Souverain Cellars and the newly opened Robert Mondavi Winery in 1966, and then some time as a consultant, wine consultant, Warren uh, founded Stag's Leap Wine Cellars in 1970. He won the top prize for his Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon wine at the famous uh, Tasting of Paris in 1976. He was a leader in the adoption of our agricultural preserve and its perpetuation in 1990 uh, with the passage of Measure J, the Agricultural Lands Protection Citizens Initiative. Warren sold Stag's Leap Wine Cellars in, in 2007, but has remained active in the vineyard and wine industry. He's the owner of an 85-acre vineyard, the Arcadia Vineyard in Coombsville. And he continues his academic pursuits, uh, having just returned uh, as a lecturer in what's called the Summer Classics at St. John's College. Please join me in welcoming Warren Winyarski. So if you looked at the program, you saw that the title of the program is Copernican Moments, and that deserves a very brief explanation. Copernicus in the mid-1500s formulated a model of the universe that placed the sun rather than the earth at the center of the universe. And this was an entirely new vision. It was a different way of looking at the same phenomena that people had observed for many, many years. After Copernicus, Nothing in the world of astronomy and beyond was the same. The old ideas and constructs were left behind. And that, my friends, is a Copernican moment, and we're going to explore that with Warren. So Warren, let's start. I'm curious, first of all, about your having moved from a career path in academia into wine. What motivated that transition? Good question. How many in this group have changed careers sometime in their life? So uh, it's about the same for me. So there's so many of you. We don't always start out knowing what we want to do. And at some point, we make a change. And we think it's going to be a change for better. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And so we change again. Change is something that's not always a bad idea. Change is what happens all the time, and it happens here, it happens everywhere, it happens to all of us. And we just have to deal with it, and we have to find a way to accommodate it and make the best of it. That's a long answer to your uh, question, but in my case, it was, my name means winemaker's son or from a winemaker, a vineyard is a vintner or a winemaker, and the ski is just genitive like Peter's son and John's son, and that's the son part of it. And I'm not sure that it had the most effect. I can't say that it did, but uh, it had some effect, and it was the life in Italy, mainly. Uh, if there are some Italian-speaking folks in here, it's la dolce vita, the sweet life. 
but the sweet life concerned having wine as a daily beverage in Italy, where it had been a ceremonial beverage in our household. And um, one day it just struck me when a friend brought a bottle of wine from the East Coast after Italy, Midwest sobriety had set in, but his bringing this bottle of wine, suddenly wine said to me, listen, listen to me, I'm talking, I'm talking to you. And that was my Copernican moment. Not, nothing was the same. I tried to find out about it. I, I haunted the stores. I read everything I could about it. I was trying to listen to what wine was trying to say. Warren, you have a, an inquisitive mind. We all know that, people who know you well. And as you said, you went further to learn about wine, and that took you on a, a path of several apprenticeships and trips to California from the East Coast, before, at least one important one, before you moved. Can you tell us about those apprenticeships? Well, I, I read in one book about a, a particular uh, winemaker in Santa Clara, and that was Martin Ray. Uh, and he lived on the mountaintop, and he made wine that, wines that were beautiful, uh, according to the author of this book. And I wanted to find out more about this man and the way he lived, because it was going to become not only an occupation for me, but a way of life, and a way of life for my family. So I wrote to him and said, is it possible to have an apprenticeship with you? And I will be to do all the things that I had to do in order to learn about winemaking. And I, that didn't quite work out the way each of us thought it might. Uh, so I came to the back Napa Valley, uh, again from a letter uh, uh, to uh, Lee Stewart at Souverain Cellars, and that did work out. So I spent two years. Uh, my title was very high in that winery. I was number two man in a two-man winery. <laughs> You've described that experience as village art compared to your second apprenticeship at Robert Mondavi Winery, which you called high technology. Yes. How, how were those experiences di well, different? The, the, uh, the, the village art was, was, was a simple, kind of a simplified version, uh, but, but it was all the essential elements were there. And so going through two years uh, with Lee, who was a fabulous master, uh, who was very detail-oriented, and, and uh, he didn't exactly explain, this is the lesson for today. He said, this is the job for today. And I had to ask, why are we doing this job? And he, he rapidly saw that my, my capacity for information was pretty, pretty large. Uh, I was asking about every step of why are we doing this, what's going to happen, if we do this, what's happening next, and why is that happening next. And so I, I, going through two cycles, that was, that was fabulous and very detail-oriented. But then I needed to see something about the larger picture, and that led to accepting the offer to become the winemaker in 1966 for Robert Davies Winery. Now, as they were just open, as, uh, first year that uh, first, I stayed there two years. Also, it was two years of uh, a, a, a larger vision, because uh, another Copernican moment was Robert's belief that the wine for visitors, the wine had to present itself to the eye by way of the building, making an aesthetically pleasing building. It had to present itself to the eye as much as it presented itself to the mouth. So what you took in your eye was very important for Robert. And, and I think no one looked at winery buildings after that the same way. Winery buildings were very simple. 
in the old days at the village art. You didn't have to have an aesthetic experience, but Robert uh, had this vision that uh, an, an aesthetic experience was something that brought your whole, more than one sense into the experience of wine. And I'm sure you all have this experience. You're all wine drinkers? <laughs> uh, Warren, you, you've said that, uh, uh, of course, the Robert Mondavi winery experience was a high tech compared to, to Souverain, but that nothing worked when you got there. I mean, because they were rushing to open and they've got all, tell us what that experience, it's 50 years now ago that the Robert Mondavi Winery opened. This is a 50th anniversary. Yes, uh, they were still building. The building wasn't complete. The concrete wasn't complete. The roof wasn't there. Some of the walls weren't there in the beginning. Of course, we had to get the walls because it had to be bonded. It had to be bonded in order to change grape juice into alcohol. You have to have a bond line. Uh, revenue is an issue for federal government. And so we put together some walls every day and took them down at night. I mean, <laughs> the reverse. We, we put them up during the day for working. Uh, and then when the, the uh, grapes were in, we sometimes took them down and uh, so it was, we had more space for operating and then put them up again uh, in order to protect the revenue. But that was a, that was a fabulous uh, experience. The painters were on top of us. All the catwalks weren't in. We were working from ladders. The plumbers were there. And as I said, at the 50th anniversary at the Mondavi Winery, uh, I smelled all of that in the wine. You could taste it, I, at least for me. I could taste the plumbers, pipe dope, the, uh, the electricians. A new descriptor for wine. <laughs> yeah. So with that curious mind of yours, another two, after another two-year cycle, another two-year apprenticeship, you decide to move on. Is that a lesson for people in the audience? That is that how you work? Two years in the wine business, two cycles, and well, you know, I like because in two years you you get to see something about all the grapes you're working with and you get some, to see something new uh, in the first year, that the second year becomes kind of drawn, driven in as a, as a, as a methodology. So you, it gets part of you. You, you, you then, uh, as you're leaving the door at the end of the day, suddenly you remember something you didn't do. That's part of, it's being part of you. And you go back and finish the job in order to prepare, in order that everything is well put away. Uh, and so you, it takes two years to do that, two cycles of, uh, in each of the wineries. And then came along another man of vision, uh, Ivan C., Dr. Ivan C. in Denver, Colorado, who loved wine and he loved the idea of wine and he wanted he wanted to bring california fruit to denver colorado and make wine there and be uh, and eventually to grow grapes in colorado vinifera there were no grapes in vinifera he was the number three winery in the state and the first winery for vinifera and the first two years, we, uh, it happened, happened to be two years, and that was interrupted for, so I made the wine for Dr. Ivan C., and then we started Stag Sleep. Well, you were still living in, in Napa Valley at the time, I'd like to roll forward to this, what I think is just a classic moment. I can kind of envision this. Um, many of us knew another legend, uh, grape grower and home winemaker, Nathan Fay, Stag Sleep. Uh, district where you ultimately located. Can you tell us about, because I think that was another Copernican moment. You go over to visit with him and you taste his 1968 homemade Cabernet. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, we had a small vineyard on Howell Mountain where we uh, we were living at, at the time. Um, 
And uh, someone told me that Nathan had an easier way to irrigate, and I wanted to go down and talk to him about that. And in the course of that, he, he I, I can't remember exactly whether he had a bottle he had already bottled at, or whether it was from a barrel. In any case, he had a, some of you knew Nathan Fay. Uh, he, he was the first man to plant Cabernet in what is now the Stagsley Viticultural Area. At that time, there were only 600 acres in the whole state of California of Cabernet. Uh, he was a real pioneer and, 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 and of Scottish extraction and therefore had some of those uh, prudent, prudential uh, characteristics. But he was also a little bit of a gambler uh, because he, he planted in, a, in when there were there were no grapes, there were no Cabernet uh, grapes planted south of Rutherford, and it was believed that it was too cold. Uh, but when I tasted his Cabernet from 1968, it was like a beam of light had descended on that glass, and the perfume was fabulous, fantastic. Uh, put together all the characteristics of Cabernet that I had tasted at different places because I had lots of friends in the valley who were in production and tasting wines of Cabernet from different regions. Tasting that particular one expressed for me a completeness, a fullness of characteristic for that variety that I had not experienced before. And so, and then you did what any good businessman would do. You bought the property next door. Well, I did. I, I, it happened to be for sale. It was a prune orchard, and and it, it was an opportunity. I wanted to buy something as close as I could to his grapes, but I didn't make the opportunity, it presented itself. And those were the grapes from that prune orchard that went to Paris in 1976. Let's just roll forward and discuss that a bit. So you buy the property in 1970. I know there are stories of Julia, who's here with us, your daughter, being out in the prune orchard and all of you uh, working on replanting that vineyard. You opened Stag's Lake Wine Cellars uh, in 70, you don't buy the winery property and subsequently, but what surprises me is that that was the second crop from what's now known as SLV Vineyard that was the wine that went to Paris and won the ta ta that tasting. A, a young wine, a young vineyard. So was it surprising to you that so young a wine would show so well against the best of Bordeaux? Was it a surprise? Was it a surprise? <laughs> the moral of that story is never underestimate what you can do to a prune orchard. If you... <laughs> <laughs> but compared to older wines yes. that one thinks of as having the benefit of age and the... Um... Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Richard, that it has to do with old as such, but uniformity of the vineyard, uniformity of the fruit. If you have uniformity of, in, under French conditions, some of this ground has been worked a long time. And uh, when they replant, which they do about the same generations as we do, uh, roughly 30 years, uh, they're in, in there now, they're in maybe in their fifth, generation since Phylloxera. Uh, so it's, it's about the same time. When you replant, it's very difficult to get a uniform stand. And so uniformity, I think, is the, is the, is the key to that. If you have uniform fruit, why shouldn't you be able to make beautiful wine from three-year-old vines? So the other thing about the Paris tasting that's always um uh, interested me, and now I have a chance to ask you about it, is that it wasn't what we typically think of as a 
blind comparative tasting where you have seven glasses in front of you with the seven wines and you're sitting with all of them and trying to judge them. It was completely done completely differently, so I understand. Can you yeah. describe that? Yeah, uh, it, it's in George Tabor's book that they had one glass in front of them for each wine as it was served. A normal beauty contest, you have the whole lineup. And it wasn't intended as a beauty contest by Stephen Spurrier. So each glass was presented, poured, and the interesting part, the most significant part, is that after they tasted, they made some comments to each other. And George Tabor, who lived, had lived in France for a number of years and was fluent in French, understood what they were saying. And they were confused. They didn't know whether it was French wine or whether it was uh, American wine, uh, California wine. And their confusion is the most interesting part because French wines were believed to be at the top of a hierarchy. And no one could break that hierarchy. Everyone had to take their place. Uh, and because they couldn't tell the difference between the top assumption, that, uh, the assumption of the top wines and those elsewhere, everywhere else, French wines did not have a neon sign to the taste when they were, were tasted blind. They did not have a neon sign saying, this is French, this is California, and they were confusing. They were, and when they said, ah, back to France, they had a California wine. Or when they said, this wine has no nose, it, it must be California. They were talking about a French wine. He got all that, and so the hierarchy suddenly disappeared. He, there was no natural hierarchy. Wines that are beautiful in one way or another can be judged without the hierarchy. And those beautiful wines, wherever they come from, and they came this time from California, could be confused with those that had supposed to be at the top of the hierarchy and supposed to be perfectly clear which is which. It wasn't perfectly clear. It was confusingly clear that <laughs> that the wines at the top that they preferred were from California. Did you know at the time, you weren't at the tasting, obviously, you were told about it afterwards. Did you realize at, the, at that time that this would be a Copernican moment for American wine and Napa Valley wine? I did not, but I must, I'm t t telling you, I mean, I was very, I didn't know who the, who the tasters were when I first heard about it and I didn't know uh, which other wines were in the group when I, when, they, when I found out that we had won the red wine group. Uh, so, but afterwards, the next morning, uh, when I did find out, it was clear to me that this was something that had changed in the world of wine. And, and I was very happy for, for ourselves but, and for California, but for the Napa Valley. Uh, but uh, it wasn't clear to me how it would grow and in significance and that 40 years later, there would, we would be celebrating the 40th birthday at the Smithsonian Institution and it had become in their eyes among the 101 objects that made America, not books or documents or speeches, but objects like the, the, uh, the compass for, for Lewis and Clark is one of those objects. Julia Child's kitchen is one of those objects. Uh, uh, the spirit of St. Louis is one of those objects. It changed the way people look at things, the way you describe the change that you don't look at the sun in the same way after Copernicus. Well, what interests me about that is that sometimes, the reason I ask, is you don't know what a Copernican moment is at 
necessarily yeah, good. when it happens. So, and I think that was true, and I want to take you now focus on the Napa Valley, the Ag Preserve, because you were here in 1968 when we adopted the Agricultural Preserve that's become a bedrock principle of Napa. And for those of you who don't know what it is, it, one of the essential elements was to increase the minimum parcel size in the valley floor, first from one acre to, to 40, 20 and then 40, and then the hillsides later from 20 to 40 and now 160. So prevented uh, uh, urban sprawl and, and, and subdivision of, of land and, and help with other incentives to keep it in agriculture. You were involved in that. It was very controversial. Can you tell us what your role was? Well, we were still living in uh, Angwin at the time, and there was a steering committee put together of citizens uh, who, who wanted to, who, who saw the need to change the way one acre was the minimum size in order to uh, give agriculture, grape growing in particular, but agriculture in general. It's called the Agricultural Preserve, uh, and it has a sign AP for zoning purposes. Uh, they, they thought we had, we had to give, we have to help the supervisors to see where the community was on this issue. And uh, we were various, it was run by Jack Davies was our chairman. Chuck Carpey was on it, uh, Louis Martini. Um, and I was on it for Angwin. And our job was to get the community uh, so to, to support the, the uh, uh, effort. You went door to door? Pardon? You went door I to went door? door to door. And it wasn't easy. Uh, as you know, uh, Angwin is a, is a Seventh-day Adventist community. They don't use wine. Uh, and, and so going door to door to say why it was important that this uh, um, proposed ordinance would pass and we would establish an ag agricultural preserve in the Napa Valley floor. And did you, at that time, this is 1968, it's eight years before the Paris tasting, which you've already described as a, a Copernican moment, was it faith, just bl somewhat blind faith in the future of, or was it looking at what was happening in Santa Clara Valley? I mean, what were the motivations? Well, I had been in Santa Clara Valley. That it may have contributed to it, uh, Richard. Uh, I, I had seen that what was all orchards before is, and vineyards is now housing. Uh, and Martin Ray was above on, on, the, uh, on the hillside, but down in the valley floor, it had all become urbanized. And so, uh, and that, that's what I, that, that helped to formulate the uh, idea for me, the, the strength of the idea and the need to support it, uh, because what I was uh, thinking ahead, I was a believer that the best days for Napa Valley fruit were still in the future. I thought we could make, and there were some models of, of beautiful wines here, but I thought we, we it wasn't, it wasn't, universal that, that there were commodity wines also in the valley, but I thought there were places within the valley whose potential was still unrealized and they, that there could, be, there could be greatness, there could be really beautiful wines made here if we had the opportunity and the time, that we had the, if we had the opportunity by having land uh, protected for agriculture. And uh, anyone who, who, who lives in this valley, uh, and I don't, this is not to say Sonoma doesn't have similar places where beautiful wines can be made, and, and it, it, it has, it, it is a national treasure. It is beautiful, and I wanted to see whether all that could be preserved. Well, you, um, your preservationist 
uh, activities continued after that. You were very instrumental uh, as part of the Citizens uh, Initiative for Measure J. So you obviously, this has been on your mind, not just at the beginning, but on a continued fashion. What, what, tell us about Measure J, which uh, uh, further protected lands from conversion from agricultural to commercial use. Yeah, that, uh, let's see, that preserves that. The Board of Supervisors is a uh, is an elected body, and and uh, uh, they could change that uh, zoning reg ordinance any time. It was, and I thought there was there, it would be good to have that sort of uh, within a larger community of of consensus. Uh, within the community itself. And Measure J changed the fact that it was merely a ordinance which could be changed by a majority vote, by one, by one vote, three to two vote, uh, any day on Tuesday, uh, which is when our Board of Supervisors meets. So putting it into a larger community which supported uh, the ordinance seemed to me uh, a very good thing to do to continue to help preserve uh, uh, the uh, agricultural destiny of this valley. I believe not every place uh, people can decide what they want. Uh, Santa Clara County decided it wanted houses. We decided, as you all know, uh, our motto, our emblem, of this valley is, on our seal, is a bunch of grapes. Uh, and vineyard rows in the background. Uh, we decided, and this community has supported agriculture as its primary uh, destiny. Warren, and let's, measure... um, let's roll forward, because I'm interested in, you always have things going on, even after the sale of Stag Lake Wine Cellars. I want to talk about your current activities. You, you told us that you did wine consulting in Colorado before you started Stag's Leap, immediately before you started Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, and I know you recently judged the Governor's Cup wine competition there. Tell us about, not outside of, outside of Napa, what's happening using Colorado as an example in the, the rest of America in the, in the wine area? What were your experiences recently in Colorado? Uh, Colorado is a, um, it has a unique microclimate. It's, uh, most of those grapes are, are grown above 5,000 feet. It has a different exposure to the sun. It has more intense light that does something to the skins. Um, the, uh, they, we had it, I didn't know they were doing this for the judges in, in, in the last Governor's Cup, but they had a little Paris tasting. They had California wines, they had French wines, and they had Colorado wines. Which one won? Uh, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we have to, they want to announce the- I thought we were gonna get a show. scoop. But yeah, we're, but no I can tell line. you this. Uh, it's you, you. You don't have to worry about the competition because they're 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 unique to themselves. They're they're a very special place where they're grown, and they have their own specific character. I can't quite identify and say what that is, the character of the wine. But the this year, I'm amazed at how much progress they're making in their in the character of their wines, in the in the excellence of the wine. Uh, they have to go back as we do, as we did in Napa, go back. The technology in the winery only has a limited capacity for improvement. You have to go back to the vineyard and improve the grapes if you want to improve the wines. Uh, and, and they have to go through that, I think. But what they what they did, but the, the tasting itself, uh, the, the Paris tasting redo, 
they did very well, especially in Cabernet and Cabernet Franc. They, they, the white wines have a transparency, a clarity, a flavor, high acidity, minerality, uh, and uh, but the Cabernets have a special kind of character for their Colorado wines, and they have their unique market, and they will continue to develop that, but it's very interesting. Well, we have grape growing and winemaking in all 50 states. America is the largest consumer wine market in the world. So have we achieved the Jeffersonian ideal of America becoming a wine drinking country? I think so. Uh, all the evidence shows people enjoy it. They enjoy it. It enhances the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the evening meal or the afternoon meal, glass of wine. Uh, it, it enhances food. Uh, and it enhances the spiritual uh, camaraderie of meals with those who partake of it. Uh, so it, it did that. Uh, and it did that, I think, um, as a benefit to us all. You know, things go full circle. You're talking about uh, the wine way of life, which you first experienced in, in Italy, and now we're talking about throughout America that same experience. And ditto for your academic interests. Even though you veered off that academic career path, you've never really left. You just returned from teaching as part of the summer classics program at, at St. John's. Tell us about what you did there. Who were your students? What were you teaching? Well, there's students. I uh, want to talk about it if given a chance. We will. Yeah. We will. Uh, and the students there are self-selected, and uh, there's some undergraduates attend the seminars. It, you don't really lecture. The tutors there don't lecture to the, to the students. We help guide the conversation. And, and the conversation opens with a question, and uh, then it, they try to respond to the question, and, and, and the tutors are there to help guide the progress and keep people on track and keep people talking to each other so that they, they don't talk to you as a tutor. They talk to each other, and you guide the conversation, and you intervene when you, when you need to. Uh, and the subject matter in, in this particular one was uh, a Shakespearean play, uh, and there were, uh, you, you know, the Shakespearean play is about, about a king who devolves, he divides his kingdom between uh, three daughters, or that's his plan, and it doesn't quite work out. And, and, uh, and the children... Um, two of the daughters don't keep to the bargain. Has anybody read King Lear here in this? Yes, a few. Two of the daughters don't keep the bargain, and he gives them all the kingdom eventually because the third daughter uh, wouldn't say what he wanted to do what he wanted them to say. Are we going too deeply in No, that? no, I love this. I love this because you told me that uh, a couple of the students were uh, estate planning and probate attorneys who had a very <laughs> clear view <laughs> about this succession plan. <laughs> yeah, it, it was good to have those people in, uh, in the class because they could show, t talk about some of their, some of their own experiences. Uh, so one of the daughters, the, the, the question is, he wants to make it publicly acceptable and publicly uh, authorized, uh, authenticated by asking the daughters, which of you loves us best? So we can make the division of our kingdom in accordance with your love. 
And one of the, two of the daughters answer, they exaggeratedly telling how much they love him, even to the, almost to their lives, more than their lives. And the third one answer is nothing. She said, I owe you according to my bond. You bore me, you bred me, you educated me, you loved me. I return it, I return the love according to that. And he said, speak again, Cordelia, lest you, you may mar your fortune. And she can't give more than that explanation. She said, very well, your dowry is nothing. And he splits her, her third with the other two. And the story goes on from there. We don't hand out King Lear to our state planning clients. <laughs> <laughs> Warren, I know you're involved in, um, before we open this up to uh, audience Q&A, uh, I know you're involved in philanthropic activities in, in Napa Valley, and one of them, if given a chance, and near and dear to your heart, you want to tell us about yeah. what you're doing there? Yeah, if given a chance to start uh, roughly 20 years ago, 21 years ago or so, and by Jim King, uh, former member of the Planning Commission in Napa County. And it's an effort to discover or find students through the high school uh, teachers and, and uh, advisors uh, who have been in a dark place in their lives, and sometimes through their own actions, and sometimes through others' uh, actions, and uh, who have changed, who have pulled themselves out of that, pulled themselves out of that place, and and uh, want education in order to help them stay on the right track. And we try to find those kids and give them help through mentoring through coaching, through financial aid, and uh, help them uh, in their efforts. And we commit to them for four years. Some of it's trade school, some of it's vocational school, some of it's higher education. We had one who, who, uh, who uh, went, went on to Oxford and, and Berkeley, and, 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 and all of them are interested, or most of them can, give back to the community. But we help them, we find them, and we're looking to build our board. We're, we're looking to, for anyone who's interested in, in helping in that kind of community service, we'll certainly welcome your uh, interest and you can get in touch with me. And you can also go online, uh, it's .org, if given a chance, .org, and find out more about the organization but we would welcome your, anyone who's interested in that activity in helping that kind of community uh, service. Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Warren, where were you at the moment you heard that you had won the Paris tasting? Yeah, that's very interesting because I was at the home where I first discovered something about wine. I was in Chicago at the home of my parents who had both passed away and I was trying to settle all their uh, estate matters. And uh, my wife called me from uh, California, from, from Angwin. Uh, no, that was, we were living in the valley at that time. And Dorothy Chelestrip had called her. She had just returned from a tennis and wine tour and they were at, they were at the, uh, one of the chateaus in France when the news came out. And she said, uh, you, you, uh, 
you remember Stephen Spurrier? I said, yes. And she said, uh, and there was, a t t there was going to be a tasting in t Paris. And, and my answer was, yes, I remember that vaguely. And she said, uh, well, we won. And I said, that's nice. <laughs> Uh, Warren, question, uh, what advice would you have for an aspiring winemaker in Napa Valley today? Listen to the wine. Never go to sleep at the wheel. Warren, just to add to that, though, when I, you showed me the hands of time uh, on one of the walls of Stagley Wine Cellars, and I was amazed by the number of current winemakers who at one point or another in their careers worked at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars. And as you go around the valley, you see this mentorship. You talked about Lee Stewart and about uh, Martin Ray and Robert Mondavi. This idea of mentorship, and I know that's important to you, has to be an in critical ingredient of that as well, and perhaps special to the Napa Valley. Yeah, it is, because even in, in, in especially in the old days, uh, it, it was a more cohesive community. It's gotten larger. It's gotten more populated. But it's still, uh, we do share information. We do share things we've done and give the results. And that sharing is important. Uh, rising tide lifts all ships, as the, as the proverb says. Uh, and we learn from each other, we listen to each other, and that's very important. Uh, and we pass it on, uh, the things we've learned. We may not pass everything on, <laughs> but we pass, a, we, we pass a lot to each other, and that's very good. Uh, and I think quite a few of those people who came thought I had a secret sauce. But this secret sauce is loving what you do and trying to do the best you can to bring out the beauty of the fruit. This is a question for both, uh, both of you, as you are both, uh, especially Warren, you're involved with the, the Ag Preserve, but both of you have been involved with uh, land issues over the years. And Warren, you spoke about those of you who came together to create the Ag Preserve. But these were family owners, the Martinis and all the rest. I'm curious what you see and what you see going forward as family vineyards, as family wineries are uh, being taken over, perhaps by larger uh, companies, and what do you see going for, uh, forward for the future of the valley as we're somewhat losing uh, those family wineries and family vineyards? There are... Uh there are still family vineyards. Uh, there, there are, and and uh, there are still individuals who are. I mean, uh, they, they may not be able to. To uh, it, it, it's going to be harder uh, to to the land cost as it, uh, when we when we started, the land cost was nowhere near. So there are there are challenges. Uh, but I think people still uh, are capable of thinking in the long, across the board, large or small, are still thinking of keep, keeping this valley as a national treasure, which it has been with the 101 objects. It has, has recognition by the Smithsonian that it, it's a very special place, and um, the difficulties of keeping it that way are, are not insurmountable, but they have to be addressed maybe in a little different way than they were in the past. And, and uh, uh, Napa has a history of dealing with difficult issues. And we have to find the ways in the new situations to make that possible in the future. I'm thinking, Warren, of 
another thing that you, you, you led the way on, I think your SLV vineyard was one of the first vineyards to be put into the land trust. And, and we've now protected, as though you know, we've protected more land in Napa County. I think it's 53,000 acres now than we have planted divines, um, either through forever wild easements or other conservation easements. Once that land is protected, as you did with SLV Vineyard, it's protected for all time. And I think that ongoing movement of the land trust, which of course is a private initiative, it's not the government, it's not a citizen's initiative, that's private efforts, I, I think, have gone a long way and will continue to go a long way uh, to preserving the valley. And we've also done it with the Arcadia Vineyard. It's also in the land trust. How do the wines of Napa today compare to the wines of Napa in the 70s? On the whole, uh, they're much more uh, sound, they're more stable in, in, in their uh, uh, uniformity. Uh, the, some of the problems we had in the early days were with corks, with closure. That has, seems to be uh, n not an issue anymore to the extent certainly to what it was. So the winemaking has been, the winemakers have been challenged to uh, bring out the beauty of the grapes to a larger extent than the, it, during the course of time. And I think on the whole, uh, they, they're, from a technical point of view, they're more stable and more sound. From the point of view of style, we seem to have shifted over to a style, uh, at least in, in part, uh, to a richer and more robust style, more, more higher sugar, therefore higher alcohol and higher extraction. I personally don't think that that's the place to be for, for our fruit because it, it obliterates to a certain degree the, the uniqueness of Nava Valley fruit. And uh, the important thing about the wine is finally is a sense of completeness you get. And I think the complete, the sense of completeness gets to be hard to perceive when the wines get so uh, ex highly extracted. Uh, what does it mean for the wine to be complete? You have to have a beginning, you have to have three things. You have to have a sense of beginning, middle, and end. And if you don't have that sense of completeness, you're lacking something in, in, in the wine. And uh, getting wines, getting grapes so rich and so ripe I could give you another three. For me, uh, we have in California, in the Napa Valley, we, we have richness, we have ripeness. What we need is restraint. Without the restraint, you, when, when it's like too loud a sound. When a sound gets too loud, it's deafening. Human beings are subject to fatigue. That fatigue in, in large sound is deafness. And in what you taste, if it's too powerful, uh, you lose the sense of place. And, and that's personal. You, you, need, you need that restraint in order to have a sense of place of this valley. Uh, 